Hello viewers, welcome to this episode of the Youth Roundtable. Well, today we shall dig deep into Uganda's search for democracy and good governance. But to appreciate this, we shall have to go back to the 68 years of colonial rule. We shall look at the post-independence years where we had the UPC government, the Idi Amin government, the Yusuf Lule government, and now, of course, the NRM slash NRA regime. Well, we shall explore our multi-party dispensation, we shall explore our movement system, among other forms of political governance that we have had in this country. But above all, we believe that all these challenges and, um, and of course, benefits have been for one reason, our search for good governance, which is a fundamental concern for human rights, but also for any progressive contemporary society. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of the Youth Roundtable. I'm joined by a panel of distinguished ladies and gentlemen. There are four, but the fourth shall join us later on. And now it's my pleasure to introduce them to you from the Alliance for National Transformation. And the only gentleman on this show today is Council Jeff Kadu. Jeff, many thanks for joining us. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Chidega. I'm, I'm happy to be here. How do you feel being on the Youth Round Table? It's, it's a privilege. It's an honor. Um, I'm very glad to be here. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion and sharing some of my views with my colleagues. And maybe we can reach some arguments and perhaps some disagreements as well. We can agree to disagree. Definitely. <laughs> by all means, by all means. Thank you. Next to Kadua, next to myself, is uh, Joanna Atukunda, who is the CEO of Uplift Slam Africa. Joanna, thanks for joining us this afternoon. You're welcome. How do you feel? I I feel the vibe of discussing governance in this country is, 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 yeah, is a whole different vibe, but I'm glad to be here and I look forward to the discussion. All right. We are glad to have you as well. Uh, the third panelist is uh, Piloya Barbara Nyeko, who is a fourth year student of law at Uganda Christian University. She's also a youth leader from Omoro District. Barbara, thank you for sparing the time to be here. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm just very humbled and uh, privileged to be here. I hope to give my best in the discussion. Thank you. Yeah, we hope to get the best from you as well. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Council, let me just begin with you for obvious reasons. Um, you're the lawyer here, and I've seen that you have interest around human rights. But just before we get into uh, deeper issues of human rights and, um, and other tenets of good governance, what, is our, what has been, okay, let's examine the, the 68 years first. What has been our search for good governance and democracy in this country? You see, to understand the story of Uganda for democracy, good governance, and our search our continuing search for this, you need to understand the background of the birth of the state of Uganda. Mm. You look at the coming of the Europeans, how they transitioned, how the government was introduced in Uganda, what form of government did they introduce. If you go back as far back as 1894, when they came and the British Protectorate was formed, the form of government, the form of government that they brought was a government that focused on specific cultural and tribal institutions. So, the tribal inclination of governance in Uganda is backed at the beginning of the state of Uganda. Mm. So, when you find some of the issues that arise today, the tribal sentiments and the politics of Uganda, these are issues that have been together with Uganda, together with the state of Uganda from the very inception. After that, what did we have? We had a system of governors and rule by leaders from the colonial state. Yeah. We had governors one by one, and these were governors who had a specific interest mm. in the country, a specific interest that went into the cultural institutions, that went into the religious institutions. And it is because of these inclinations that even today, these religious and tribal sentiments continue. Mm. So, within that period, between 19, 1894 to about uh, 62, yeah. we had that period, we had the Kabaka crisis, the, the first Kabaka crisis, let me say, mm. which birthed the clash of the state, between the state and the tribal institutions that they had found. Mm. So, it was the state of Uganda mm. being pitted against the kingdom of Buganda, and yet... That is the mode of governance that had been introduced. Mm. So we find ourselves in such a situation where many of the problems that we have today, 
many of the challenges to governance in Uganda today, many of the challenges to rule of law, many of the challenges that we have, the cultural challenges, the religious challenges, are all birthed from the state of Uganda and the institution of Uganda and the form of governance that was introduced in Uganda. Because if we see that the state of Uganda is birthed out of the Buganda argument, the Amkole argument, the Toro argument, mm -hmm. how then do we reach a position in 2020, for example, and we say we now want to divorce ourselves mm -hmm. from, from the tribal institutions, from the cultural institutions, if the state of Uganda is bathed in religious wars and the colonial rulers supporting Anglican candidates, Catholic candidates, as against Muslim candidates, for example, mm -hmm. how then do we come today to divorce ourselves from the roots of the governance of the country? So mm -hmm. to understand this question, to understand this problem, you have to look at the roots of governance that was sold in Uganda between 1894, the early part of the previous century, in order to understand where we are now. Why did we reach here? How did we reach here? And if there are elements that we want to change, how do we reach the change that we all desire or that we all want? Well, uh, Barbara, let me just come to you. Yes. Jeff has done justice in terms of trying to cast some light okay. on, um, on that colonial time. Mm. But a fact that I want to point out is um, the contradictions that we had, whether to go unitary as a country or should we stick to the monarchy uh, system of governance? And the, the, oligarch, the oligarchies from, uh, from, from Mengo were pro, um, uh, they were pro kingdoms and pro monarchies. Whereas the UPC government, led by the then president, Apollo Milton Obote, were pro a unitary government. So do you think that perhaps in that time we made some mistakes, that we should have been more decisive and said that let us go unitary? as a state. Because some of the challenges that Jeff is talking about emanated from the 1961 constitution that made, for example, Buganda a higher, gave it a higher status in the country. Okay? And because Buganda was pro-monarchies. So do you think that we should have been more decisive and said, you know what, we are going unitary or should we have preserved our kingdoms and cultures? Uh, well, uh, thank you so much uh, for that. Uganda in the 19, uh, the 19 00, Agreement that was actually signed uh, gave privileges to some uh, institutions like Buganda Kingdom back then. And uh, before these colonialists actually uh, came in our country, just like my brother has uh, discussed, uh, we, ha we had our very uh, diverse system of kingdoms. We were ruled in our various ways. That is the unitary thing you're trying to bring about. Mm -hmm. And, uh, for example, the Toro had theirs, the, the, the Cholis had their, their rots, you know, uh, Buganda had their Kabaka. And then you find that, uh, you realize that in these, uh, in these kingdoms or in these organizations, they were trying to, they, they, they all united as one. In that, a Buganda would come in a Choli land and this person was actually welcomed, okay? Someone from Toro would also come in a Buganda land and this person is welcomed highly. And this brings about the question of the Buyaga and the Buganga is if we can all understand mm. that by then Bunyoro was uh, as a reward to Buganda. It was brought part of as part of Buganda kingdom. Mm. Yes. And yet these people were meant to be part of Bunyoro. Bunyoro. Mm. Yes. And so when Obote by then he was the prime minister bringing about the democracy and so forth. He was the prime minister then. So when, when Kabaka fails to uh, to, to, to vote, fails to sign that document that would actually recommend these two counties to go back to, 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 uh, to Bunyoro. Then Obote, there that was, that was in the document that signed that, uh, that in, the, in the instance that Kabaka does not sign, the mm. prime minister would actually do the signing. Mm. And so you realize that because of that, a number of challenges has cropped up. I remember what uh, one of my history teachers told me that if there is if there is a Langi that is hated so much, that must be Obote. Why? Because of what he actually did then. Mm. I don't know if you're going to, if you're trying to picture out uh, a few things. You'll understand that even up to now, it has brought about tribalism. It has brought about some aspects of disunity. Why? Because we are clicking onto 
uh, the aspect of uh, the Monaco kind of government. Mm. Okay. Well, I'll delve in more and more into into uh, the explanation. But all I all I want to say is uh, we were better off in the unitary aspect than the Monaco. All right. Um, Joanna, let me just come to you. And I want to pick up from where she has ended. We were better off with the unitary government and not this whole monarchies. But the UK, for example, has a hybrid of both. Okay. But you cannot say that the UK has not developed all that democracy can be challenged even for a second. Yeah. We have seen the Prime Minister's resigning voluntarily. I, I, I mean, what level of what, what higher level of democracy is, can we reach? So is it right that um, monarchies are a breed for disunity, are a breed for tribalism, are a breed for what you'd call a failed state? Is uh, that hypothesis true? Uh, thank you, Kidega, for that question. So for me, uh, looking at the, at the monarchy and the, and the unity, when we look at the uh, United Kingdom, mm. it's because, like you said earlier, we needed to be decisive, mm. what we want to be. Because when you look at the monarchy kind of system, it's that uh, when it was in existence, uh, like she said, it, it, was, uh, it was in existence, but in a way of unity that someone can come from this kingdom and visit the other kingdom and they are good to go. But then when... Uh, they, when it was tried to uh, be brought back, it became um, kind of a competition mm. that now Buganda is going to be top, then Tora is going to be next, then the other one is going to, uh, then the other kingdoms are going to feel like, no, we can't, we, we can't coexist with, uh, with these kingdoms that seem to be above. Mm. And yet when we look at the United Kingdom, it is, it is uh, they do not, I don't think they have the different uh, kind of... Uh, kingdoms and monarchies that are in existence. So it mm. was very easy for them because they were decisive with that one monarchy system that they have. Mm. Now, when it comes back to our context, do we actually have, do we have that one monarchy that puts us all together? Or we are just uh, trying to coexist at the same time, uh, conflicting, but, but behind the scenes of, of, no, we can do this. I think we just needed to, the, the whole question is, does it work in our context? And if it doesn't, what best suits us? Because even when we try the 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 unity is it, it is it is still the monarchies are still creating some kind of, of cohesion that this one is greater, the other one is, is is less. And and so for me, from that understanding, I think that we needed to understand our context and that is what should have informed our decision mm. on whether to go monarchy or to go. United and not just uh, mix the two, and mm. then we lose the balance. All right, I'm I'm trying to get my head to appreciate you guys' argument, but but, but uh, Jeff, let me just give you a chance to compare the two. But as you do that, I want to put this to our notice that at the clamor of Africa's independence, Kwame Nkrumah convened African leaders who later became post-independence leaders the likes of uh, Jomo Kenyatta, the likes of uh, Hastings Tamuzu Banda, who became Malawi's independence leader, he convinced them in Ghana and said that, seek first the political kingdom. And these were his words, seek first the political kingdom and anything else shall fall in place. We have been able to identify the, all these issues. And I think as we advance slightly post-independence, we shall see that some of these conflicts remained with us. The UNLF government overthrew another. You look at the Idi Amin crisis. You look at the 1980 war. So is it true that Uganda, in our search for good governance, we have taken so much time focusing on the political, on, on who is at the helm, and not the actual fundamental issues of democracy and good governance? Have we had our guns firing in the wrong direction? But also as you compare the two, Unitary vis-a-vis -vis monarchy, did they cost us? I don't think it is accurate to narrow it down to just two, that we could have chosen to either remain a monarch or remain as a government or run as a government, as a republic. Mm. Every country, every nation is a product of its history. Yeah. Every country is a product of its past. It's a product of what has happened before. In the making of the Ugandan state, 
we need to appreciate that initially the idea was not governance. It was purely a trade idea. So when the then traders came and they wanted to carry out trade, their idea was to begin with the central region before they spread out, you know? So that is why the initial contact that you had, the missionaries, the eventually the colonialists, was with the central region. And mm. that is why eventually you find that it is people from central Baganda who are being used to spread colonial rule to these areas. Mm. So being a product of that history means that over time, Buganda enjoyed what you would appear, what you would think, what you would call a privileged position, yeah. not from governance only, but it began from trade. Mm. So if we make that transition from the Imperial British Company to the Ugandan Protectorate, you're beginning from a position of strength, you're posi beginning from a, from a position of privilege. And that has continued in some respect or in some way to date. And what did this pseudo-privilege lead us to? This pseudo-privilege is reasons why you have things like the eventual Kabaka crisis coming up, where you have Buganda wanting to secede from the state of Uganda because they have more resources, they have more financial abilities. So that background does not put us in the same or in the best position to make a single vote that let us become monarchs or let us become a unitary republic. Because cultures and tribal regions or and tribes exist in spite of the state mm. that actually existed before 1984 with the British came. The Baganda existed. So in this attempt to loop us together, mm. it was inevitable that there are bound to be some shoulder rubbings, mm. you know? And this is when you get into that transitional period when we are trying to hand over the colonial state back to the citizens. And the citizens have to sit on a table and agree. Obote is across the table. Kamaka Mutesa is across the table. They say, how do we reach an agreement of a Uganda that works for everyone? Where do we draw a line? How do we find a balance? But all this comes from the state's history. This comes from how we were handed over independence. The people who attended the Lancaster Conference that made the constitution, it is everything leads to the other thing. Mm. And eventually it arrives at where we are today. Yeah, yeah. And just to keep you right there, do you think that Ugandan leaders misconstrued what Kwame Nkrumah said? And they came back home and just focused on their personal interest, their, 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 their kingdom's interest. And they forgot that there is a common good. There's a bigger picture. Because Kwame Nkrumah said, seek first the political kingdom. So it appears as if Ugandan leaders were focusing on, I want to get to that political kingdom. Anything else, the economy, whatever, will come after. So do you think perhaps we, miss, we took out of context what Kwame Nkrumah said in Ghana? Yes. I don't think it was taken out of context. There, there is a saying that hindsight is twenty twenty. <laughs> when you're looking back, it is easy to say we did this wrong. Yeah. We did. We should have done this. We should have made this instead. Mm. But I need you to understand that the power dynamics at that time were very different from perhaps the power dynamics we have today. Mm. The power centers of Uganda in the transitional period leading up to independence, mm. Buganda was a central actor. The Catholic Church was a central actor. The Anglican Church was also an actor. Of course, you can argue that their influence on Ugandan politics has since reduced, but back then they were central actors. Mm. So much so that you had Benedict Chuchuanuka step in. He says the initial election that is held, he's announced the winner. But this is a Muganda man, and he's a Catholic man. Mm. So, ideally, you are going to have a Muganda Catholic leading the country into its Indep independence. Mm. But then, the Baganda on one side have a leader, a cultural leader. Yes? So, it would have ranked an ordinary, mm. I'm using the word ordinary uh, loosely, an mm. ordinary Muganda above 
that are culturally installed, Muganda who's at the helm of the country. Mm. So when we look back, we can say, yes, uh, we should have left Benedict to Chiwanuka to remain the president after we have seen what resulted from the alternative that he chose. Yeah. But the power dynamics at the time could not allow it to happen. Mm. The power dynamics at the time included you have the British who are our colonialists, mm. which is a majority Anglican Protestant state. Mm. Yes? They were to hand over power to a Catholic. Hand mm. over power also used loosely. Mm. They were to hand over power to a Catholic who is also a Muganda, mm. not the highest ranking Muganda. Mm. So you see how the power dynamics of such an exchange made it difficult yeah. to have that transition, mm. which forced another, the election that eventually backed Kabaka Yeka, UPC. UPC. So w there is a context behind mm. all of this, mm. but at that time, it was focused on where was the power and mm. where was the influence. All right, um, uh, Barbara. Yes. We are focusing on our history because, like Jeff said, a country is built on its history and on its background. But the 68 years of colonial rule were actually orchestrated by Otto von Bismarck in Berlin, in the Berlin Conference that convened all those European leaders and said, okay, let's go and, you know, scramble for Africa. Mm -hmm. So uh, just, just as we discuss our search for uh, democracy and good governance, do you, would you consider the 68 years, because they came in the form of protection, Uganda was, was declared a protectorate, mm -hmm. but was it protection, was it patronage, or plunder? Because plunder is where the issue of resources comes in. Mm -hmm. And resources is an issue of governance. Because people scramble, f I mean, you, you can't distinguish resources and governance. So which of the three was it? Was it protection, was it patronage, or plunder? Well, uh, it's, it's a very interesting one. Because I quote that from Paul Makubia's book. Uh, yeah. Now, um, Uganda's search for democracy, I, I want to, uh, to term it as an African question. Uh, why I say so is uh, it hails from our history uh, when we were, we were all colonized, okay? As an African country, Uganda was also first the same colonialism where the Otto von Bismarck and the rest and the likes moved, traversed Africa and, uh, and you know, and, and colonized, and Uganda became a protectorate, the British protectorate. And now, um, in line with, the, with that, what, what happened was that when these people came in, it was a question of interests. When they came to, to Africa, Uganda in particular, these people were interested in a number of resources in Africa. And uh, when they came to Uganda, they found, like my brother said, Uganda was organized. We lived before these people came to Uganda. We already have our kingdoms. We already had, uh, we, had uh, we were organized in our own ways. We had resources. I mean, we had our Niles and so forth. So when these people came in, uh, with their own intentions and interests, they traversed Uganda in particular. But when Kriyame Kirma uh, said that, let us unite and uh, liberate our country, that the Africans, the Musevenis, the, the Julius Nyerere and the likes were to go back to their country and unite as one and make the Africans uh, choose the form of government, governance that was actually best suited to them. Uh, this is what happens in Uganda. Uh, the Museveni, His Excellency, gets to the country and uh, tries his level best. But before it was noted, it was in the times of the Kabaka. Mm. Okay, so Kabaka becomes the first president of this country and uh, deputized by the prime minister that was aborted then. And then we realized that uh, by then the system of governance was not as we expect now, and that. Uh, they had to rule in the best interest of the Kabaka who would not betray a, a Muganda. He was to re remain loyal to his people. Mm. And also other kingdoms had to remain loyal. But it was a question of who birthed what. Yeah. And how were we uh, appreciated? We, we, we realized that the reason as to why all that happened was that they were the entrance of everything that uh, the British 
came through Buganda yeah. and then used them mm. to actually help uh, bring about other 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 uh, yeah. kingdoms into the system. Mm. And then the aspect of uh, religion was also there. Mm. The aspect of uh, political parties were used. You see the DP, the, uh, the, there was DP, there was Kabaka Yeka and all these other parties. We saw the Catholicism, we saw the Protestant and all that. So all these were aspects that were actually used to bring about the colonialism. But then it is a question of if we must get to a one Uganda and, uh, and become democratic again, as we understand that democracy stems from the, uh, from the word demos and kratos, yeah? To demos, demos means the people and then Kratos means the rule, okay? It's basically the rule of the people. Mm. So if we must get to that agenda of the rule of the people or people getting to rule themselves mm. but by the majority rule, that means that we have to get the interest of each person and then we, we see how best we can... Uh, we can work upon harmonize. Uh, yeah harmonize mm. and, uh, and 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 settle to uh, a democratic well thank you um Lynette welcome well our, our viewers like I had promised you shall be joined by a fourth panelist Lynette Nanyonjo is uh, the youth chairperson of the people's progressive party madam thank you for joining us I'm honored to be here all right just as you settle in let me bring in Joanna Joanna <coughs> We are discussing our search for democracy and good governance, mm. but I feel like we are crying foul. I, 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 I mean, look at countries like Singapore. Mm. Post, post, because Singapore, I think, whereas it's a cliche narrative, mm. without fear of prejudice, I'll use it here. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah? It's okay. That Singapore and Uganda were at the same level at some point. Yeah. But post Lee Kuan Yew, who was their independence prime minister, that ever since moved, they have gone on to become a big economy. So aren't we blaming the colonial rule too much and forgetting that we have actually been the biggest orchestrators of our lack of democracy, if you agree with that, or we have played the biggest role and not the colonials? I totally agree. And I, first of all, I, I, I want to thank the person who chose the topic, search for good governance. It's like we've searched for forever. I, I don't know when the search began, Mm. But we have really searched, and I, I, I'm not, I'm not sure whether the search is about to end. Mm. But looking at the at, at at Singapore and Uganda being at the same level, and after that, we get the independence, and then at that point, I think it is where the Ugandan leaders were supposed to understand themselves, mm. understand their context, and then move forward to what they want to see. Uh, the Uganda after the 68 years look like. But now here we are still searching for good governance because everyone, um, earlier on, he, he talked about, um, he talked about uh, the, 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 the chain never ending because of that decision. Like we can't blame that decision that was made mm. or whatever informed the decision. But I'm thinking every decision that was made in mm. every single meeting of, of colonizing Africa, of of um, of that of whichever of every agreement that was signed, we cannot run away from those decisions because every decision that was made informs what we are going through now. Yeah. We cannot run away to say that we can't, we cannot not, um, we cannot divorce or detach ourselves from those decisions because. Whatever the intention was that was personal, I don't think um, when we look at the effects of colonialism, mm. if, if the British came and, and all they had in mind was to scramble for these resources, scramble and, and for, for everything that we have, every meeting that they did was for their own benefit. Mm. And look at us how uh, 50 years later after uh, coming to 60 years after independence, we are still looking for where did we miss the point? Mm. And so for me, I think, yes, we are blaming them. But at the same time, we forget that we are doing exactly what they, they were doing. We look at every, every president that stepped in. Even Idamin, when we look at, okay, he, he chased away the, the, the yeah, Indians yeah. And, and wanted the Ugandans to devote by themselves. But it was a military rule. Like he did not... 
everything he did was for his personal benefit. And who did he give the property to? The Muslims. Who are the people that were benefiting from whatever he was he was getting for whatever he was doing as a president? Mm. It was one party. So, like every leader that steps in, it, uh, um, he talked about when we see a Muganda Catholic coming in as a leader, it is a Muganda, but who is Catholic? So the benefits actually going to be uh, individual best as well, and it is still happening now that. Even we look at the constitution being alternated like from left, right, center, it is still for personal gain. So the decisions that were made are still affecting us because we have not run away from them. We are still using, we are at the back of our minds when you sit in a meeting and, and someone says, uh, like, though we are here, if I sit here and I know I am supporting, uh, I'm supporting you, to make a decision, it's because I'm benefiting from that decision. Mm -hmm. Should there be a point when you're not in that decision, I'll also make a decision that benefits me and whoever supports me is going to be in, in for the decision that I make. And that is why we are still searching for good governance away from, from uh, politics that come in uh, every after five years. We still have a lot of questions in search for good governance and democracy because the decisions that were made then right from the British colonialists and, and, and actually even from the missionaries, they all, as much as they came for to spread the word of God, they yeah. also had their personal gains that they were looking for. So yeah. we cannot run away from those decisions. Lynette, let me come back to you. I'm sure if you had the chance to speak to one of these NRM stalwarts, <laughs> they would rate our democracy as a progressive one. I mean, what is democracy anyway? We have periodically periodic elections every yeah. five years, don't we? Yeah. We have a constitution that recognizes human rights. We have a whole chapter, chapter four, yeah. that talks about Bill of Rights. You talk about um, independence of the judiciary. It is clearly distinguished in the constitution that the judiciary shall be independent. So as we move towards our search for democracy and good governance, do you think that we have made certain progressive steps towards realizing good uh, democracy and good governance? <laughs> I really have a totally different opinion about democracy and good governance. Okay. First of all, I think as Africans or as Ugandans, we have not understood what is democracy and what's good governance. Okay, and that's, understand. That's, that's, that's the missing point. Okay. Because clearly China is governed and it's not democratic. Can we say it's, it's, mis, it's misgoverned? Can we say the governance in China is not good? Clearly no. We can see their economy growing. You can see things happening. Mm. So, do we need, for me, my question now, as Uganda, as Africa would be, do we really need democracy or do we need good governance? Because that's, that's where we, we miss the point. We often think democracy and good governance have to walk hand in hand. One leads to the other, but one can actually excel without the other. Mm. And for me, unless we go back to the drawing board and understand that these two are different and we can choose which works for us, Mm. Is it the democracy or the good governance? As for now, we have tried the democracy. And clearly, we know the answer to that. Can we now go back and try good governance? Because we cannot... All of these things have happened, but six years down the road, even our colonizers have sat back on the drawing table and said, okay, as UK, what works for us? I think, I think the pound is losing strength. Can we Brexit from Europe? Can we try and redo our things and redesign what works for UK as the United Kingdom? But Uganda won't. And we choose not to see these things happening because everyone is re-strategizing to see how best do we move forward. We are stuck with the concept that was sold to us and the, the sellers of this concept have even left the concept itself. They have sat down and said, okay, we have done this and we are, we are thinking it's not working for us. Can we go back and design what works for us? Mm. In my own opinion, I do not want to go in a direction of NRM is right, this one is right, this one is right. Because at some point, someone is doing something okay and someone is doing something wrong. Because when we say, like Joanna said, whoever is making the decision, it's benefiting them. Because now when we say opposition, uh, we are the alternative. And yet, even as the alternative, 
when we go to parliament and become the leaders of opposition, the first thing we ask for is a budget raise from a country that we've been clearly saying is bleeding economically. So the conversation of democracy and good governance for me now hits different. Mm. And if you ask me in my honest, honest opinion, I think we should go back and ask ourselves, do Africans or do Uganda need democracy or good governance? And if it's good governance that, that we need, how do we go about it? Because we are struggling with very many concepts and that's our practical reason for failing ourselves. We pick concepts here and here. Uh, one day we are capitalists, one, the other day we are socialists, the other day we are liberal. The, we keep on picking every concept, every foreign concept and making it a blend to work for us, which is not, which is not it. Because trust me, Africans lived before democracy and whatever, whatever it is, we call it good governance or whatever, was, in, was introduced to us. Did they literally like shred themselves to pieces then? If they didn't, why do we think if we scrap off democracy and go back and redesign something that works for us, we will shred ourselves into pieces? Whose narrative are we driving at? Because it's also very important to know when we stick to these norms of democracy or what we call good governance, because we've merged that too and said democracy is good governance, which is not true to me. I, uh, uh, Council Jeffrey, I want to bring you right there. Uh, Lynette makes what, what I don't term as controversial, but uh, uh, interesting statements. And I want to relate what she has said with what Dambi Samoyo said in her book. She said that, um, and Dambi Samoyo is a Zambian, economic scholar. She said that what African countries need is not a multi-party dispensation, but rather a benevolent leader. So Lynette is saying that perhaps we need to define our own democracy. Do we need multi-party, for example? Or should we go back to things like the movement system whereby we don't have to have all these political parties? So is it high time we redefined our democracy or we should be at the same level with where the globe and other contemporary societies are heading. Uh, I think I want to first respectfully disagree with that quote, that Africa needs a benevolent leader. You see, one of the challenges that you create when you put entire systems, entire nations at the mercy of individuals mm. is that more often than not, you suffocate institutions. If they're benevolent. Yes. No, <laughs> you see, that's the thing. Mm. Being benevolent is at mm. his whim. He chooses to be. He can choose not to be. Mm. He can choose not to be benevolent if it's not to the benefit of himself or his desires to remain in power. Okay. And that is the first challenge. You know, we cannot get the future of the country, the hope of the country, the economy, and put them at the hands of, the lead, of a leader in a hope that he shall be benevolent. That is the first challenge. And that is how the death of institutions mm. begins. So to get to, to her very interesting submission that Uganda is more in need of good governance than democracy. One of the key tenets of good governance is accountability. A state that is accountable to the citizens. Yeah. That if we have a budget, this is how the money has been received in the consolidated fund from URA. This is how it has been spent. This is the expenditure. This is how much we have spent on education. And that is why things like state of the nation address are important, though you can argue they have become performative in Uganda. Mm. State of the nation, budget reading, um, information, courts of law. It's all critical because it gives us accountability. Yeah. And even states that do not have <coughs> democracy, they have some level of accountability to the citizenry, because these are the people who pay the taxes. These are the people whom you make decisions for. Mm. Now, how does democracy come in? Democracy comes in because it is critical to hold leaders accountable periodically. And I understand the argument that very many times they do not go hand in hand. Yes, but how do you intend to hold your leaders accountable that they will exercise good governance 
without elections. The purpose of elections is that after four years, come back and are in government. Let us look at the things you said you're going to do. How have you scored on education? How have you scored on health? How have you scored on security? Let us hold you accountable. If you do not perform, we vote you out. We bring in my party, the Alliance for National Transformation. Four years later, ask us, Alliance for National Transformation, how have you performed on health? How have you performed on education? How have you performed? Democracy is not meant to guarantee good governance. It is meant to hold leaders accountable for good governance, such that their failure of good governance allows the people to tell them, Chidega, you have been a member of parliament for the past five years, but you have not scored on A, B, C, D. Jeff, let us, let us look at, at, at the Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia, Oman. Mm -hmm. I don't know if those guys have elections. Do they have elections? Mm -hmm. But as we speak, Qatar is holding the, nation, the, the world's biggest event. Do you, can you for one second doubt that they don't have a healthcare system? Can you doubt that there's, there's lack of education? Can you doubt their infrastructure? But they don't have elections. You see, <laughs> the, the challenge here is we are very easily misplacing or replacing words with words they are synonymous with. Mm. The specific word I chose was accountability, <laughs> holding people accountable. Mm. And accountable the, basing on what? And I said on infrastructure, the purpose roads, of democracy, healthcare, yes. communication. Yes. And that the is the purpose, yardstick. Mm. The purpose of democracy is it gives us a platform, us the ordinary people here, mm. to hold the leaders accountable. Mm. You will go to those Gulf countries, whereas they do not have elections, can you say they do not have accountability? They have accountability. Ministers are fired. Ministers are jailed. Ministers are forced to resign. You know? And you see, it the all whims, comes at down... The and masses now, the uh, and, I, and that is exactly <laughs> what I was going to come back to. It all comes back to every state being a product of its history mm. and where it came from and how the state was born. And if you look at the birth of the state of Uganda, the colonial period, it is because of that birth, it is because of the unique Ugandan story that we chose that the mode of accountability we shall have for our leaders is periodic elections. Mm. I will give you an example. You can say democracy has been tried in the United Kingdom. It has been tried in the United States. And democracy gave them Trump. Democracy is why the UK has had four prime ministers in, in one year. But you see, the beauty of it, and let me start with the example of the United Kingdom. The beauty of it is that it goes back to accountability. That after eight years of Barack Obama, the people of the United States said, Democrat Party, we have seen what you have done for eight years. You have failed us on this, that, this, and this. Let us vote the Republicans for these four years. What happened after those four years? They said, Republican Party under Trump, you have failed us on this, 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 and this. Let us bring the Democrats back. And then now the ones in power. Mm. Four years from now, I think in two years, uh, one this, year, the election, yeah. we are going to, they are going to go back to the polls and say, Joe Biden, we appreciate you on this, 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 and this issue. We have now voted you another term. Or Joe Biden, we do not appreciate how you have handled these issues. Mm. So... Mm. Let us, so democracy has never been a guarantee of good governance. It is not mm. meant to be a guarantee of good governance. Yeah. It is a guarantee of accountability. Mm. And functioning democracy can guarantee you good governance. Every government exists to stay in power as long as possible. Mm. Of course, in Uganda, they try to do it through illicit means, army, and whatever. If that is the history of the nation. Mm. But the purpose is to stay in power mm. or with the mandate of the people for as long as possible. Mm. And what better way to ensure that than being accountable to the people so much so that they choose you as their leader. All right. Uh, Jeff, I, I hear your point. But Joanna, I want to bring you right there. 
uh, if you look at our constitutional framework, mm. Article, I think, 70 provides for the systems of political governance that mm. Uganda shall adopt at mm. any point T. Mm. And it provides for a multi-party political so, system. Yeah. But therein, it provides for the movement system yeah. that where one is in place, the other is in abeyance. As it stands now, Ugandans chose multi-party dispensation in yes. 2005. Mm -hmm. But it, because, again, I will go back to Dambi Samoyo. She said that African countries waste so much money holding periodic elections. Elections that, that are always questioned, but the taxpayers' money being used. Actually, at times we borrow to hold yeah. elections, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, 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 and that is because there's this whole part, oh, multi party, oh, I'm um, FDC, oh, I what am, Jeff is saying, say. you know, I am, I am I'm DP, I am all these things. Mm. Are we ready for that? But also, should we go multi party or should we have stayed with the movement system as a form of governance? Uh, for me, I think uh, multi party would. Given our economic status. Yes. Yeah. Given and our history, yes, because <laughs> we will not we will not disregard the fact that all these parties are also using a certain amount of money that we are struggling to get. Like the the same parties that are crying that oh we, this this government is overstaying in power, we need we need a change. They're equally looking for resources exactly. to stay in to also compete for the same power. So why we chose the multi party system? For me, on one hand, it is. It is good mm. that people, uh, the democracy, that people have have a, a right and a choice to belong to which party they want, mm. as for as long as it it is it affiliates to their to their belief system and and on on leadership and governance. Mm. But also the same multi party system, as for Ugandan context, it is not giving enough a uh, platform. Not, not, it is not given enough platform to exercise what it should be doing. And even when it does, who is there to say, this one is not doing right, this one is, is doing wrong. When he said that, uh, in, in the Americans are going to say, the Republicans, you're not doing well. Please calm down, let's have the Democrats. Now, in our context as Uganda, we have the multi-party system, but we do not have the democracy of the people to say, please, NRM, step down, let's have ANT go in. And if they're not doing right, because I believe each of these uh, parties, they have, they have what I would say their cause. If we put FDC, we will know that uh, because its history is based on a person who believes in a good healthcare system, we will know that once he's there, an assumption of what has been displayed. Mm -hmm. Probably the healthcare system is going to be up there. When we put someone from ANT, this is probably what we expect. We this is what we expect. But remember, all these parties in Uganda actually split up from one party. So the guarantee. Which one? <laughs> all these generals were part of the of the bigger uh, NRA. Yeah, NRA. Uh, Apart from mine. Though. Apart from yours. <laughs> okay, so at the end of the day, we, I don't think the ideas are going to be different from what we have. Yeah. Like I said before, everyone is fighting for their benefits. Mm. Whether we go movement, whether we go multi-party, the question now should be, like uh, with democracy and good governance, whoever steps in, are they able to give us good governance? And I think good governance and democracy, which one is a subset of the other? Good question. Let me ask Lynette. Lynette, just to come back to you. When you look at good governance and democracy, one thing that you cannot um, rule out is the aspect of rule of law and constitutionalism. Yes. I think for both of them to thrive, the aspect of constitutionalism must be upheld. Now, it is you who made uh, controversial statements, and I'll put this to you, <laughs> because when you look at, for example, our constitution, the mischief behind Article 32, which, was, which is about affirmative action, is that because women and, 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 and youth had been uh, marginalized, there was historical injustice, and therefore there was need for affirmative action. So do you think that our constitutional framework as a, as a country promotes okay, democracy or promotes good governance? <laughs> because in the sense that women are now part of the political space because of a constitutional provision and a constitutional framework. So do you think that the 1995 constitution was a good consensus? And that it promoted or still promotes good governance or accountability. So good governance 
and uh, democracy. When you talk about the constitution, I think the framers of the constitution framed it in the good spirit. Yeah. The implementers are the question at this point in time. Mm. Do the implementers still have the same spirit of the framers of the constitution? Mm. No. And, and for me, that's where the problem begins. Mm. If there is no good implementers, if the implementers do not have the will of the country or do not hold the country at the heart to know that if we make a blunder or if we scrap, if we have a pigeonhole constitution, it's going to stain this country for more years to come. Because what we are doing now might not affect us as a generation, but it will, it will surely affect the future generation. If we do right now, the future generation will have a good country to live in. If we do wrong now, the future, the, the future generation will suffer the consequences. What we are seeing now started with Milton Obata with the pigeonhole. That's why you see it is okay for someone to say, scrap off the age limit, scrap off the term limit, scrap off this, scrap off that. We might wake up one morning that the affirmative action that you're talking about is scrapped off. And you cannot kill someone that scrapped it off anyway. So for me, uh, going back, I, I wanted to go back a little bit to what council says. In a country like Uganda, where you think you want to hold people accountable, but you can't. <laughs> At this point, we, we, we celebrated as the young people. We have social media. We shall hold them accountable here. Guess what? There is a law now. You cannot say anything. The moment you say, Pim! they'll look for you and say, aha, please mm. meet the CMI. Explain yourself why you are doing this to your country. Yeah. So for me, the question is, at this point in time, do we surely want accountability of the things that we cannot even speak about? Or we want to see service delivery happen to our ordinary Uganda? My grandmother in Chalusowe village makes sure that her banana leaves Chalusowe village get to Kampala on a good price so she can pay school fees for her orphan children. But Lynette, orphans or something. the law is saying don't spread false information. Mm -hmm. Do you want to encourage the spread of false information? Do you want to encourage defamation? But have we seen the people that have been arrested, have they all been spreading false information? Oh, please. Mm. Caught me if I'm right. This is my word. Mm. The first son has <laughs> thrown a couple of words here. How mm. Uganda is going to attack Kenya. Mm. Mm. That is false information. Mm. That man should be in jail. Is he in jail? No. So, who are we protecting? Who is this up against to? Mm. Who are these laws made for? Like Joanna says, yeah. the interest of several human beings mm. are supposed to be protected. And for me, at the cost of what? Mm. Mm -hmm. At the cost of everyone else. And if we stick to protecting certain individuals and their interests at the cost of everyone else in the name of democracy, spending and doing whatever it is in the name of elections that we will never respect, mm. What? Why are we even trying? He, you clearly stated. Are you are you a result of an election? Because I know you hold a political office. Yes. Did you believe in that electoral process? Yes. So you can believe in your own in your own process, but then the rest you can disregard. The processes I'm talking about are not our own internal processes. Mm. I am saying, because now we are talking about the governing system at this point. So meaning internally at, in PPP, you're okay. Of but course. outside... Of course. But you see, Chidega, let us also not play a blind eye mm. and act like we live in oblivion where we do not see things happening in this country. Mm. Eh? Mm. <laughs> so, like I said, when the framers of the law of, of the Computer Misuse Act framed it, the connotation was false information. But we've still seen false information being spread. But no one has been arrested over that false information. Mm. But if Chidega here said something that is contrary <laughs> to what the framers want to hear, mm. you will be put in jail. So for me, I want to say, multi party dispensation or multi party system is not the problem. Mm. The spirit of governance, the spirit of the country yeah. is what we are lacking. And if Saudi Arabia that does not have, or China that does not have democracy, we see a minister that slept in an international conference being told to resign because that disre disrepresents the country. And this minister actually believes that this is not a good thing for me to do and I should resign and step down to make my country grow or to provide 
odious for my country to do better. Mm. And for us, we would rather drag the Honorable Moses Ali to sit in plenary even if he falls off the chair. But he is a minister and yes. his, and this is taxpayers' money. And we do not see the pain in the name of having democracy as an alternative. Mm. Chidega. I beg to submit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Barbara, let me just yes. come to you. When you speak about democracy, good governance, the aspect that uh, the good philosopher from France, Montesquieu, said that we must have separation of powers, yeah. that the executive should be independent of the judiciary, and so should the legislature. Legislatures. Now, let's evaluate Uganda's situation. Because if you look at the legal framework, perhaps it is put out explicitly. The powers of the judiciary are laid out at Article 126. The powers of the executive, Article 98, they're all laid out. The powers of the legislature, Article 79, around there. Yeah. So do you think that, for example, separation of powers is a key tenant of democracy and good governance? Or you want to borrow the words of uh, the, the former chief justice, Odoki, who said that these three arms of government should be like three stones on which a pot sits, that without one, the others cannot function well. So how do we achieve separation of powers, but also trying to incorporate the checks and balances. Because we need, how do they call it? <laughs> like, we need the judiciary to hold these other two, two arms accountable. Mm -hmm. And so should they, should parliament. So, but how do we achieve this? Okay, well, uh, thank you. Uh, the question of uh, separation of powers stems from the root. You see, if you want to climb a tree, you start from down. Mm. You don't climb it from up. And why do I say so? Uh, look at the judiciaries. They are appointees. <laughs> okay? Of the executives. Yes, of the executives. <laughs> mm. Look at the, the, the legislators. How are they elected into parliament? How are they voted? Mm. Look at those who vote them. Are they empowered? Are they educated? Do they have the knowledge of whom to vote and why they are supposed to vote so? Mm. Okay, so why, why am I trying to bring this? Because if deep down there in, in, in each uh, maybe constituency, okay, uh, we have people that do not know whom they are supposed to vote in power, okay, and then they get to vote because they, they have forces behind them, mm. okay, perhaps they're not empowered, and then some aspects of empowerment comes in, and then they get to vote people based on what they are given at a moment, then such, uh, such people that have voted are lawmakers, okay? Mm. Are they going to do what is right for the country? Look at the executives, which are also appointees at some point, okay? Mm. The ministers and so forth. These people are also appointed. Now, others are appointed from those that are voted in power, mm. okay? Those are the, the MPs and the likes. So if they are appointed and they are up there and given the powers that they need to actually implement the laws that are being uh, made by the lawmakers in the, you know, in, in parliament or whatsoever. And then yet they are being influenced. Okay, I don't know if you're getting that. But that is what Odoki said, that these should operate, there should be a cohesion between them, that they cannot completely be separate, that they need to be interconnected. And that's how they should work. I feel at some point I want to disagree mm. in that because if they are connected, then they will be influenced. Mm. Then the, the laws that we are going to make are going to have some pull and, and, and you know, push somewhere that a face will be behind it and the laws that we shall make or anything that shall come out of that shall be because someone said something. Okay. I don't know if you're trying to get... So I, I believe, I feel uh, that they have to bring in someone, mm. okay, to bridge that. Mm. Like some an independent person should be there where the judiciary will be independent and they're not influenced by maybe the executives and the legislators. All right, just, just because we have seen the judiciary, for example, mm. taking clear positions against decisions of parliament. Mm. You know that in 2000, when parliament passed the Referendum Act, court said that, Parliament abused the procedure through which they should have followed to pass a given law. So is your argument right to say that because there is some level of interconnection and therefore the independence of the judiciary is completely undermined? Perhaps maybe you'd want to pick interest in the landmark decision yeah. of uh, Gerard Karuhanga versus the Attorney General. 
that challenged the appointment of uh, of judges in acting capacity. Mm. I think when uh, was it Odoke yeah. had reached mandatory age and then he was reappointed in acting capacity and all that. I, so, so, so I, I, I don't know which way do we go because, trust me, they cannot be completely separate and independent. I mean, I, I feel there should be a body that uh, that individually governs such uh, organs that they're not interconnected in any way because then you cannot bite a hand that feeds you. I don't know if you're trying to get my argument. Okay, uh, Jeff, let me first hear from you, Jeff. Separation of powers. Is it something that we can achieve completely? Or we set up for checks and balances? I, I think in very many ways the two work together. And it's important that we separate two things. There are human flaws and human errors that have failed the systems in place. Okay. And there are failures of the systems. So when we have a system of checks and balances, Ideally, it means that the executive, legislature, and legislative arms of government are checked by the judiciary, and vice versa. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a delicate interplay between the three. Mm. Unfortunately, what we have in Uganda, which is now the human error, not a system error. When you look at the system, mm. the system says the executive is independent, the judiciary is independent, the legislative arm shall be independent. Now the human error comes in when in appointment, members of the legislative arm are appointed in the executive. The human error comes in... No, but no, Jeff, those yes. are constitutional provisions. Yes, but... The law says that the president shall appoint from the legislature yes. members of, of his cabinet, a given percentage, and yes. a few others shall be ex-officials. Yes, but you see... The law says that the president shall appoint the chief, just, uh, the chief justice, of course, with the recommendation from the Judicial Service Commission. Yes. Mm. So... That is the system. Mm, that is the system. Yes? Mm. But what happens is the human error is what I'm explaining. Mm. When you look at the laws, the laws of Uganda are very good. Uganda, I think, has some of the best laws in the region, actually. Mm. Very progressive laws. We came up with anti-torture laws before very many countries. We had laws against so many things. There are so, we have very progressive laws. We have a very progressive constitution, affirmative action, mm. as we earlier alluded to. So that is the system. That is the system in place. Mm. But then what happens at the human error? Mm. When the human error comes in? Because you cannot test these systems. You cannot test these legal provisions until you have put them into the into the actual laws of the gov of the that govern the country and mm. you see how they are received and you see how they actually work with the people mm. and that's where the problem comes in not in the law mm. on paper we're supposed to have three separate arms of government on but in reality a leader of one of the arms of government is for example chosen in Changkwanzi. can you say that law is wrong or oh, it is the human error that has caused that mistake so if you find yourself in such a position that a Speaker of Parliament, for example, is chosen by members of the executive, that the executive mm. first sits and appoints the leader of another arm of government. And then, when you want to challenge that system, you go to another arm of government whose leader is also chosen by the same executive. But those are internal political processes. And no, they're, they're not I, internal I, political I haven't processes, seen they're legal. I, I, I have not seen cabinet sitting down to decide on who they will rally support behind for speak of parliament. But I've seen the sake yes. of the NRM party. And the party. I've seen the NRM caucus sit. Yes. So and perhaps some members perhaps... of the executive sit on all those parties? But I mean, Very many. Yeah, but I mean... Do you see the human <laughs> error? <laughs> no, but are these human error or it's, or it's fusion? <laughs> yeah, but, but, but you I see, think it's fusion of institutions. It's, it's, it's not fusion of, of institutions necessarily. It is... I, it is deliberate. It is done deliberate. It's not by mistake. It is mm. by specific design mm. that these things are made that way. Mm. Yes? So it is, there, there is a purpose as to why mm. the leader of the legislative branch or the leader of the judiciary is chosen in a specific way. Yes? And 
that specific way is not because there are no laws. It is not because the legal framework does not allow for there to be separation of powers. It is because in the implementation of mm. those laws, mm. the human error. Well, let's take a short commercial break. But just to end us right there, I think what is important is the spirit of constitutionalism. You can have a good constitution, a good work on paper, but if the spirit of constitutionalism is lacking, it's only a piece of paper. Well, see shortly after this commercial break. Stay with us. Digital rights are those human rights and legal rights that allow individuals to access, use, create and publish digital media or to access and use computers, other electronic devices and telecommunication networks. Digital rights include a right to freedom of expression, information and communication through technology, a right to privacy and data protection, a right to credit for personal works, a right to universal and equal digital access, a right to identity, a right to anonymity, a right to be forgotten and a right for protection of minors among others. The state's digital rights are frequently violated through various unfair actions, for example, blockage of websites and social networks, theft of credentials, unauthorized use of people's data for personal gain, privacy intrusion, online censorship, arrests and intimidation of online users, internet blockages, and a proliferation of laws and regulations that undermine the potential of technology to drive social, economic, and political development worldwide. It is hence every citizen's responsibility to respect rights of other digital users and to speak speak out or report to the responsible parties when one's rights are violated. Well, we'll be back on that short uh, commercial break. Jeff, let me just give you a minute to wrap up the point of uh, separation of powers vis-a-vis -vis checks and balances. Do you think that it is possible for a country like Uganda, which many have described as a growing democracy, to actually achieve total separation of powers, or the conditions may not permit us to to take that direction? Well, I, I, think, I think it is very possible. In fact, it is very possible. But it requires two critical things mm. in order for it to work. The first one being, we need to change the country's political culture. Mm. It's very critical that we change the political culture of the country. What do I mean the political culture? The political culture of Uganda currently is lack of accountability. Mm. The political culture that we have today is lack of regard for opposition or divergent views. Mm -hmm. The political culture that we have is for intolerance. The political culture that we have is of <laughs> lack of respect of the rule of law. So we need to change these and there has to be very deliberate work done. There have to be deliberate steps taken to change the political culture. Secondly, after we have changed the political culture, we need to create a civically competent citizenry. We need citizens who are civically competent, civically aware, because this shall help them to hold the, comp to hold the government accountable. It shall help them to hold the people in power, their members of parliament, their councillors accountable for the failures of the system. And you see, why is this important specifically? It's important because it, people do not know. There is a lot that people do not know. I will tell you for a fact, there are many judgments in Uganda. Justice Sekana is always releasing judgments against government may be for torture, for illegal detention, for numerous offenses, yes? But beyond that, there is so much more that citizens have within their power that they have not exploited, mm. you know? Access to Information Act. You as Chidega, you can go and request to have the oil agreements brought to you here. And if they don't give them to you, you go and take them to court and ask the Attorney General presents them. But do citizens know that? Have they utilized that power? Do citizens know how to hold the people in power accountable? But then the challenge that we shall have, when we pursue all these means, when we pursue all these, the challenge we shall have is the political culture that we have grown in this country, that we have cultivated in this country, does not allow for this. It does not allow for divergent views. It does not allow for the people of Uganda 
to have a mode of governance that is what it appears on paper or as it appears on paper. Well, fair enough. Joanna, mm. let me pick it up from where Jeff has stopped the political culture. Mm. Is it a winner take all system? Because, for example, I had Dr. Kizarist one time say that democracy doesn't work in Uganda. Another political party emerged, went into an election. No, he said elections don't work in Uganda, rather. Yeah. Another political party emerged, went into an election, and replaced Dr. Kiza Vesage's political party mm -hmm. as the LOP. Now, the question is, what is the nature of our elections, for example? Does it meet the standards of any legitimate election? But also, as you examine that, have in mind that a new political party displaced, I mean, before you begin to point fingers and, and castigate, have in mind that the people who you intend to castigate were voted out in certain parts of the country. So if elections don't actually work, who these people have ministers and you know vice president and all these things, we are voted out, yeah. right? Yeah. So do elections work in Uganda? But also, what is the nature of our elections generally? Uh, first of all, over time, I don't even know why we waste money doing this, these elections, but we have to do them anyway. No, but uh, any people will tell you that the, it's worth it. It's, yeah, any people will tell you it's worth it. Then the the FDC of then, uh, like. You said Dr. Kizares, you said elections do not hold any waters in this country. And well, earlier on, he talked about accountability and saying, if you know your rights and you have access to information, you can actually go ask for this information. And should you not be given this information, you can go to court. And my question is, how of the 40 plus million people in Uganda, how many do we even have, do we even have a quota of people who are like, like they don't know they they know what's happening in this country no we do not have them and why it is deliberate there's a time when people were pushing the constitution be put in every local language in this uganda was it put how many people do we know that have english and can read the constitution and understand it when we talk about decentralization was the decentralization about putting health centers and having uh, villages turned into districts just to, to be there. How many, even those those districts, how many do we find that we, how many do we see put out uh, civic education on those districts? Civic education comes three weeks to the elections and what is it talking about? It's, it's usually, um, we had a discussion last week and they said it, some of the things that the government does, it is after civil society organizations have made noise and then they start from there Plus, they pick what they want so to are do. So, you, are you putting this on the ruling party? On, okay, on the government? Yes. Then how, because you say that how many of these districts are actually doing what they're supposed to do? But there are some districts that are being led by opposition. There are some districts that are being led by opposition, but it, I will not, again, so, differ from what I said, that people are on their personal in interest. And if they're being led by opposition right now... All I'm saying is maybe you, you might want to qualify your statement. Rather yes. than saying that the government is doing ABCD, then perhaps you don't because say the individual. If right now, because there are certain mm. uh, districts that are not being led by NRIM mm. leaning LC fives, mm. but they aren't doing what you're saying should be done. The, if any of the opposition so is members it, is it an issue of the government no. or an issue of the general let's, political let's, class? Let's be clear on this. Mm. We have all been in this Uganda for for whatever years we have. Mm. If any, and I believe most of us have actually been born in this government and we are still in this government. If I woke up one day and let's say I'm, uh, I, I, I'm an MP and I'm an opposition uh, MP mm. and I go and hold a civic education rights and I start telling these Ugandans, if this does not work like this, go and report this person. If this, will I even sleep in my house? I, I, want, us, I want us to have an honest opinion. <laughs> will I even sleep in my house? Yeah. Okay, it seems you live in a different Uganda. But <laughs> all I know is that you can try and we can and we find out from you. <laughs> because every time we, the civic space has been shrinked in this Uganda, that even if you are an opposition leader and you wanted to do a civic a civic rights education in your village, hmm. 
that very evening some drone will pick you. But back to election. Mm. I think Do they meet the, the bare minimum of standards. The minimum they meet is that people contest. They have their their flyers and posters out there. And then of course the, the ballot papers are, are are taken to all polling stations. As for what happens with the results mm. and who determines the results and who wins, it's a different story. All and right. I think at that point is where we say that um, elections do not and are not are not giving us what they're supposed to give us. And you did not I, I, I beg to take you back that my question of democracy and good governance. I think democracy should be a subset of good governance. So when we are talking about good governance, we talk about, democracy. We, we talk about democracy, but the democracy is going to come that if you have given, if you have been an example of good governance, or you've tried your best to actually be a good governor and, and, and the government is doing good, then democracy automatically finds its way. I just want to, to add on something small. In a minute. Said. Mm. I might use less than a minute. Mm. You see, opposition leading some areas elections being held in Uganda, having civil society organizations, all these are very, very crucial for a government such as ours that is trying to buy legitimacy. You see, an election is critical for legitimacy because whenever the people come and tell you, oh, NRM, you're not the rightful government, guess what you'll say? We held an election. Mm. We held an election. <laughs> the elections were counted. You had agents at uh, Chadondo. Mm. Actually, some of our people even lost in those elections. Mm. It is critical. That legitimacy is critical for anybody who intends to stay in power for long enough. Mm. You need legitimacy. You need validation from the systems that you have created. Especially when you can use the what is on paper. Everyone knows the reality of the election that was held. Mm. But they will tell you we held an election. Mm -hmm. Actually, you even went to court to contest that election and you withdrew your, your matter. You mm. withdrew your petition. Yeah. What if you are going to succeed on the petition? You understand? Mm. So it's very, very tricky and mm. it doesn't give an accurate picture for us to say we have civil society with all periodic election, which do not contextualize what actually happens mm. in those processes. If we do not give the full context of those processes, the arrests that were held, the people that were killed, if if we do not give that context, mm. these are merely shows that and the state, that and the government legitimacy, mm. but do not go down to what is actually required. Venus, I'm coming to you. Jeff speaks like he's party leader. Because mm -hmm. I've had the general <laughs> Mugishamu to say that I admire him very much. I've, 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 had, I've had I've had the general Mugishamu to say that the end result is as important as the means that you use to get to of that course, point. Of course. So I, I I I'm sure whatever he uses, is very proud of you. <laughs> but uh Lynette, let me just come to you. The role of youth mm. in achieving a democratic society. When you go back to evaluate Uganda's history in terms of political governance. The likes of Apollo Milton Obote came, came, came to lead this country at a very tender age, around 32, 30, 33, around there. President Museveni became president at around 42. But so many other leaders at the time were quite young. And this isn't only in, in Uganda, but Africa in general. The likes of Samora Michelle of Mozambique, the likes of uh, Thomas Sankara, they, they became national leaders at a very tender age. Let's examine for a bit the role of young people in terms of achieving a democratic society. For example, you belong or you lead a youth wing of a political party. Are your views actually, do they influence decisions in your party? Before we evaluate our role at national scale, in your party, do the youth matter? Are your voices heard? Personally, in my party, yes. Yes, because I sit in the executive body, of the, the top most executive decision body that's a of question of party. form versus substance <laughs> no <laughs> by, but by form you could be on the executive but the substance, no, 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 by substance. Influence yes. Decisions. yes okay yes and I, I and for me personally i am glad because mm. one being a woman that would have put me way below the radar mm. but being a woman 
of my age mm. and making decisions in my party, I think for me, that's a plus. But my party being one of the minor <laughs> minor <laughs> parties, <laughs> political <laughs> actors like you call us, yeah. mm. it makes no difference really. Yeah. Because even if I groomed a thousand young girls or a thousand young people to this stature, because I tell you, Uganda does not lack young people with content or with leadership skills. Mm. Chidega, we cannot sit here and say Uganda lacks young people mm. for, of quality to lead this country. Mm. Yeah. We actually have a thousand, if not millions. Mm. But going back to what he said, the political culture of this country but does not... Is that, is that fair fact? Because if you compare the sixth parliament of the likes of uh, Robert Mao, the likes of Agri Awori, the likes of Mugisha Muntu, the likes of uh, um, of both both of Humbi, they were fairly old guys. But if you compare that parliament to the parliament of today, where there are many young people, you'd see the contrast between the two. Going back to the so political culture. Is it about culture, the age? It's not the age. I said, like going back to the political culture vis a vis, because you said that in the respect of the young people, mm. what is the quality of the young people that get to that parliament? Yes. The political culture is, key, is a key player on the quality of the legislators we have. Yes, I agree. In a highly monetarized political environment like mm -hmm. now, yeah, yeah, yeah. a young leader like Chidega Moses that has ideas, that has information, that mm. is well-groomed for leadership, mm. will not get a seat in the third parliament. Mm. While Elinette, who has a well-financially mm. abled father, will get a seat in parliament. Mm. Yeah. Now, that changes the dynamics. Mm. And if this culture is not worked on, because we have had conversations about this monetarized levels of election, this monetarized electoral processes and all of this. And if these conversations happen and the, more, the next election is more expensive than the previous one, you get? Going back to what he said, the political culture, mm. the intolerance. People at this, at this point when the economy is shrinking, there are people that are ripping from the economy shrinking. So much. And when they reap these billions of money, they'll save them for election, which is coming in the next three years. Yeah. Mm. And what will happen? These are the people that will bounce back. When we talk about the opposition that went vis-a-vis -vis the opposition that is in, what is their quality? Mm. And how did they come in? They read on the fact that they, the country was already weeping. And because opposition had been curtailed, it looked like the other opposition was not doing so much. Mm. So on that, with money, we have uh, musicians come in parliament, like the Luda of Kakuto. She, mm. He just finished his form <laughs> six, and then he became an MP of Kakuto. Mm. Will he deliberate for the people of Kakuto? That's a conversation for another day. Mm. Weren't there capable people in Kakuto to become the MPs? They were. But the culture. Mm. Secondly, it, I think it is also a deliberate move for the ruling government to have this quality of leaders yeah. because it will not give them so much trouble. Mm. If you have someone that cannot sit or stand on the floor of parliament to clearly state what exactly is wrong in their constituency, mm. yeah, and they are members of parliament, how will they even understand this, uh, the budget of Uganda, the budgeting processes of Uganda? Mm. How will they sit in the, uh, the, that day they read the budget? Half of the Ugandans do not know mm. what is going on with what they are reading. Because mm. the English, the, the, the figures, the numbers, we do not understand how these things work. Mm. The instruments that have been put in place to gazette this country, I remember as among the young people that have been advocating for the ACDEC chapter to actually be implemented in this country because... Mm. Clearly, the judiciary system of Uganda is failing us on all fronts. We need mm. another accounting arm um, to really account for us on certain matters. Mm. Uganda was the first people to sign, among the first people to sign. Impl impl uh, ratification and implementation has become a problem because they know that if they implement this, a young Joanna, a young Chidega will hold this document use the information, the civic information they have, and go and walk to African Union and say, well, you said this document is supposed to provide good governance and democracy. In my country, this is not happening, and we are signatory to this, and we have rectified, and we have implemented. Why are you keeping quiet on these things? But these instruments we bring, we, we sign, we are quick to sign. Implementation lacks, and I don't take this for a mistake. It's the framers of the government. Mm. 
and wrapping it up, they want to create this culture so that Ugandans entirely lose lose is it, lose the love of what's going on in the mm. political arena. Yeah. In that way, they will be easier to govern. Because I mean, I am struggling to put a, a plate of food on my table. I will not know if they are reading the budget or if they are not. I will not know. Look at how, I don't know why I want to use the Computer Misuse Act so much. Look at what happened when the Computer Misuse Act was passed in Parliament. Mm. There were lots of conversation. This, this, manya, this the, the lady that is governing the, the Uganda Airlines, manya, the criteria, manya, what, before you know it, it's gone. And the culture that he has been talking about mm. has been created as a narrative. It has been created, not as a narrative, sorry. It has been created to keep Ugandans in a state where they are governable. Okay. And as long as they are governable, the government can easily sweep whatever they want to sweep, scrap whatever they want to scrap, and obtain the legitimacy they clamor for. Okay. Barbara, yes. let me come back to you. You've been quiet for some time. And as we evaluate democracy and good governance, one thing that I would stand for is the rights of women. Okay? Uganda ratified, for example, the Maputo Protocol that put in place that the rights of women must be upheld, they must be considered in whatever decision that you take. We ratified the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights. Okay? Our constitution, Article 33, provides the rights of women. So do you think that if we are to put Uganda on a trajectory on how much we have progressed to achieving the rights of women? Because I ask this because I know that you run a foundation yeah. with Kony Konyaro, foundation. which means hope the girl child, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, do you think that Uganda has made progress in terms of uplifting the rights of women and protecting them from the historical injustice and patriarchy? Uh, well, uh, that's a very interesting question. and. Uh, that comes at actually a very right time. Uh, the women of this country, back in the days, uh, we see that as, as government progress mm. from one, uh, one leadership to another here and there, mm. we see that really we have progressed uh, as women. We have, we have been empowered in a number of sectors. You look in the agricultural sector, you look in the, in the aspect of leadership. You know, I could give an example. Lynette here holds a position somewhere, you know, so that means that talk uh, of the vice president of the country, the speaker of parliament. The I, I, I mean, I mean, I would start from here, mm. <laughs> like I said earlier on, that you can't climb a tree from from, from the top. up. Yeah. Yes, he start one day. Maybe she would become the speaker, the yeah. next speaker of this country. Definitely, yeah. That is what I actually foresee. Mm. So all I'm trying to say is that the government has done a lot uh, mm. in line with empowering girl child. And uh, yes, there is still much to the empowerment, mm. but they have really, really progressed and have done well. Because when you look uh, in the government of Amin and Idi Amin and wherever, you wouldn't mm. see any, any, any woman in the leadership position, okay? Mm. As, as maybe the speaker of the country, as the vice president or something. But when you look at the NRA government, they've tried and empowered the women in that aspect. Also, when you look deep down in the villages, women have already been empowered. When you look at the affirmative action, that actually gives the 1.5 points to a girl child, mm. okay? That has actually encouraged the girl child to actually stay in school, okay? And, and also empower them to think that, yes, we are equal. It's not, it's not the question of equality, but it's a question of equity. Mm. I don't know if you, 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 you try and, and understand. But also that comes and stems from the hard work of the government. All right, but you see, as you give kudos to the NRM, which I agree with you in that regard, mm. do you also want to mention that even up to date, the women that are deep down in the village still face domestic violence? Uh -huh. The early ch girl child marriages still exist up to date. So, has the issue of women emancipation been taken as an elite? concept and that yes the Lynette and the MPs the woman MPs yes the elites they understand it and have benefited from it yeah. but you go deep down there gender bio, gender based violence issues patriarchy teenage pregnancies still is a song of the day uh, well it is uh, it is when when you get deep down to the root you'll also realize that uh, the women are not yet fully empowered mm. 
However, the empowerment is not equal. When you go to the uh, when you go to the uh, to the develop maybe to the to the central aspect of it or in the in the urban areas, you'll find that it is overdone. It's under it's it's overrated. Mm. But when you get to the village and uh, in these other areas, deep down in some village, you'll find that. Uh, the people that are not yet even empowered, they do not yet understand their rights. They don't really understand that, yes, much as I am a lady, I can, I can actually do what a man can do. Yeah. So that means that we need, there is need for balance kind of... Uh, if this side is overdone, then, then we need to get back to the root and then try and empower those ones as well. Yeah. Then also, we realize it's not a question of empowering a girl child. If you want to empower the girl child, you yeah. have to empower the boy child. Yeah. Because then it is the boy child that is the cause of the of, of disaster that come about the to a girl child. Yeah, yeah, true. All right, thank you. Jeff, let me just come to you. And I want to put you on the spot here. The issue of militarism in Uganda's politics. If we are to be able to discuss democracy and good governance, I think we must distinguish, we must divorce the military from our politics. Today, as it stands, the military are constitutionally represented in parliament. The UPDF, every electoral cycle, sends 10 members of parliament. But guess what? The interesting part is that your party leader at some point did represent the UPDF in parliament. I think that if we are to distinguish or divorce the military from our politics, they first of all need to leave our parliament. But your party leader at some point did represent the UPDF in parliament. And now here he, here he is saying that we have, we have the military that has gone so embedded in our politics. Perhaps he also played a role to achieving that. I don't know. You see, in everything, and if you remember what we began from, the state of Uganda today in 2022 is a product of the state of Uganda from 2010. Mm. 2010 is a product of 2000, 2000 is a yeah. product of, and so forth. We cannot understand where we are today, mm. the 1995 constitution, mm. without understanding all that, all that went into coming up with that constitution, the decisions and the process that led to it. But most importantly, the history. You see, we can't address a question of militarism of Ugandan politics without looking at the role that the military has played in Ugandan politics since its inception. You can go as far back as the King's African King's Rifles, Rifles yeah. if you want to. You mm -hmm. know, the role that the military has played in Ugandan politics since its inception has always been a central role. Mm. From, uh, from the colonial government to the government that was handed over to. And I'll start, I think, from post-1962. Because post-1962, you have the Mengo crisis. Yeah. Idi Amin, as the commander of the, of, uh, of, uh, the military, storms Mengo. The Kabaka has to escape into exile. Mm. The, uh, Idi Amin, as a commander, he props up his then boss, mm. Dr. Obote. Excellent the leader. Uh, of course, Dr. Bote is helped by other generals, the Oito jokes of this mm. world, and others. Shabano Eventually, mm. the same military that props him overthrows him while he's at in Singapore. A Commonwealth Conference. Mm. Yes? Mm. So he's overthrown by the same military. Mm. Now, interestingly, the military that overthrows him is also overthrown by you another left. military. That with the help of the Tanzanian Tanzania. forces, mm. of course, after the Moshi conference, all that events that led up to that. Mm. Yes. So the military again overthrows Idi mm. Amin. That is now 1979. Mm. You reach uh, 1981. Uh, okay, that period, that transitional period, of we course, have some, we, we have, have some semblance of, of uh -huh. civil government. But still, mm. there is military involvement. Mm. That whole period while they are preparing a transition, which is really how mm. to bring back Obote, mm. it is also with the military Was chaired in by Kawanga? Was exactly. It? Mwanga? No, the, the, mm. the, 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 there, were, there were a number of actors, there were a number of political actors. Mm. Museveni was actually one of them. Mm. I believe he was Minister of Defense for Bina Isa at the time. Mm. Yes? So, the number of political actors, but even during that period, mm. you have the military 
with a significant central role. Mm. I believe when after the overthrow of Amin, it is Oito Jok himself who announced on Radio One that the government has been overthrown. Mm. Then we began the transition to the return of Obote. Mm. Obote comes back, but still the military is playing a central role. Then mm. the now chairman of the NRM, before it became NRM, 27 guns, he enters the bush. Mm. Again, the military. So does that, ju used does again, that justify General Gishamantu's military creating a base. contribution? I am creating, let's say, a starter <laughs> for how we reach 2020, how we reach the buffet of 2022 mm. that we are now enjoying. Mm. These are the starter meals that mm. the country was fed. Yes, mm. the NRM, which is, of course, after the demilitarization in quotes mm. of the NRA, we now, so we are now introducing civilian rule. We are now bringing the, the people back, mm. you know. But what happens before they bring the people back? A lot of militarization. Some of the people who take up the positions are military men. Mm. General Kahindo Tafiri, mm. internal affairs. Uh, Mugisha Munt was also a minister. Uh, soldiers. They start the process of pseudo demilitarization. But that process to date, um, mm. unfortunately, has never been completed. You know? Mm. So it, it's a very long. I, uh, maybe if you would invite us all. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. To right. discuss, no, no. discuss no, no. the militarization. Yeah. Of so, okay, politics okay. Just because as, as we just put a full stop on, whole... on the whole military issue, mm. how can we divorce? How can we send the UPDF back to the barracks? How we send the UPDF back to the barracks? is by changing the political culture of Uganda, if you could believe that. Okay. Because it is today, it is engraved in the very basis of the Ugandan system, mm. that if we have elections, expect the UPDF on the streets, expect police, police expect All the first opposition, the, op the leading opposition leader to be put under house arrest, supervised by the military, expect then there were black members, now there are drones, the changing face of the military in Uganda might not be as it was mm. in 86, in 90, in the early 2000s, but it's still there. Today we have the SFC, we have... Many, but it's still there. It's just outfits. an evolving face mm. of something that, mm. unless we change the political culture of the country, is not going to go out. Okay. Joanna, let me <laughs> come back to you. <laughs> Let's just look at the East African community a little bit. Mm. The Republic of Kenya... I think if we are to gauge the seven countries of the East African community yeah. in terms of democratic achievements, I think mm. Kenya could stand tall. Yeah. We have seen their most recent, recent elections being meeting so many standards. But of recent, um, a UDA member of parliament, UDA mm. is the party that, uh, that, that William Ruto belongs to, mm. said that, you know what, uh, Rais Mifanya Kazi Vizuri, we should give him another term. Like, if a president is serving well, mm -hmm. he deserves another term, and yeah. perhaps we could deal away with the whole term limits thing. Yeah. So now, a country that is seen as a beacon of democracy in the region yeah. is beginning to have certain tenets of saying, okay, you know what? Can we remove term limits? So, should 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 they successfully... Okay, because, well, I've seen Ruto coming out to say that, no, well, they will not change the constitution and ETC and all that, yeah. but in the unlikely and unfortunate event yeah. that Kenya amends their law to remove yeah. term limits. Mm. What would that mean for the democracy of the region, but also for Uganda that is looking up to Kenya? So, I want us to agree that Africa as a continent, our problems are not different. Mm. Mm. Uh, earlier on, uh, actually in the middle, of, in mid this year, I, I, so I happened to be a Mandela Washington Fellow. Mm. Yes. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting indeed. Mm. So while we traveled for the alumni enrichment program, African leaders from 49 countries, mm. we are together in one room. And every time someone puts up their hand, it's the same problems, same issues. Mm. And I'm thinking, at what point are we going to divorce from these issues? Because... And then when you talk about the East African region and the seven uh, countries that are coming together, when we were talking about challenges of the East African community, we always, uh, if, even Africa uniting, it is 
we have different economic systems, we have different systems of governance, so every, the culture is different. And I'm thinking, as these seven countries are being, like, there were three, then they add uh, the fourth, Burundi, Rwanda, they add South Sudan, now DRC. Mm. What is uniting us and what is the purpose of this mm. unification? Of this unification? Strategic security, common market, so many. So many things, but whose interests are they serving? The people. Oh, <laughs> so we say. Because when you look at, and after the unification, mm. now, one by one, they are borrowing the same ideas. Mm. And let me tell you, the thing is, what we forget is that by the time this information leaks, it has actually been internally discussed. Mm. By the time a member of parliament in Uganda says, uh, I think parliamentarians should be the ones to vote the president. Mm. The, the, no, the discussion has happened in Nakasero, has happened in Entebbe, has happened in Changwanzi. Mm. And so the rest is, 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 they're just trying to see the reaction. Mm. Like just Some, to, yeah, to test, to the, test water. the waters and see what is the reaction. Mm. Then, of course, the, 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 the elite class will get on social media and blow some noise. But the water in um, some region, in uh, not even region, in some village, mm. do, do they even know what is happening? Do they even know the noise you're making on Twitter? They do not. So getting back to the concept of do we see do we see uh, Kenya borrowing the same things? They will definitely borrow them. The same as Rwanda. How long has Kagame been in power? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure it's been some good time. Youth voice Rwanda. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> some, good, yeah. some good time. Yes, yeah. some good time. And is he planning on leaving any soon? We don't know. Because now, for, for us here in Uganda, we are lucky that we can sometimes sit and blow noise even if they keep looking at you like, keep blowing the noise, you will get tired and go back home. Even mm. if you blow, what is going to change now? In Rwanda, mm. it's even different. That when you're called on a talk show like this one, you first remove your brain of whatever history that you know, keep it in a box, then support everything that is going on. Then as you're going back, you put on your brain back and go. Mm. Now, is it any better? Not at all. It's not any better. So this unification of this of the East African region, before you know it, mm. they're going to keep pulling one by one, one mm. by one. And God knows who is behind the motive and mm. of what interest is it. But before I don't it, think integration would be a bad thing. It's, it's not a bad thing. Mm. Like we talked about the culture. The mm. thing is, what is the purpose? The purpose. What is the spirit the behind spirit the unification? Behind the what is the spirit behind... Uh, Someone just steps into power before they even finish six months, they're already thinking about changing the constitution. You understand? No, well, uh, the, the person you're saying mm. came out to right. distance himself Very from that, right. so perhaps we could cut him some slack and give him a, a benefit of doubt. A benefit of doubt, yeah. but like I said, and to go to Lynette <laughs> as, we, as, we, as we wrap this up, yes. But, 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 but thank you, Joanna. I, I hear your point. Very good argument, right there. Linet, as we try to wrap up this conversation, you are discussing about governance in Uganda. But one time, I think J.F. Kennedy said that the peace and stability and the good governance in America can only be sustained if there is the same elsewhere. We can discuss good governance in, in Uganda, but if our neighbors are being poorly governed, and in this hand to bring in the DRC, mm. you look at Goma, Eastern Congo, has been in conflict for time immemorial. Eastern Goma is ungovernable. So, as we examine governance in Uganda, do you think that the lack of governance, the, the, the lack of state presence in Eastern DRC could have an effect on the governance status here in Uganda? Rather because now we are participating, we are sending there our forces. We are, so For me, the, the, the million the dollar question is who destabilizes Congo to that point? Because <laughs> when you ask the, the Congolese, she would know who is destabilizing them. <laughs> and they speak it out loud on the streets. Who are those? They know. You go on Twitter and see. They know. Eh? They know who is destabilizing them. Mm. So for me, I think the question of Congo is, is not because of poor governance in the nearing countries. The question of Congo is about the interests in Congo as a country and what Congo has to offer. The question of the destabilization in Congo, Eastern Congo vis-a-vis, -vis, is where we see the largest, the, the, the largest 
chunks of tim timber, the, like, the gold, the what, the what. These are very crucial mm. to not only the nearest countries, but also to our dearest colonia colonizers. So for me, I think that it, the destabilization of Congo goes beyond East Africans. It goes beyond the governance. It goes beyond the things that we assume are the reasons of the destabilizing in Congo. Mm. And it comes back to the interests of it being destabilized. Okay, but how does that instability, how does that lack of... Because I can assure you, mm. the Kinshasa government mm. is not present in Goma. Mm. Goma is being occupied by militias, around one to the three militias. Mm. M23 and all those things. Mm. Now, there, there is no governance in that area. What we describe here as governance, having the judiciary, having mm. the what, it is not there. Mm. So my question is, how? and you know that Goma is not very far from Kampala. Exactly. Goma is just here. Exactly. Mm. So the question is, how does that lack of governance in that area play into our situation here in Uganda? Is there a correlation? I or there is none at all? I think there is. There is. And, 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 and going by the word of... Uh, the general, he has said clearly that the M M23 are our brothers. brothers. <laughs> so for me, I think we should not take those things lightly. Uh, like like Joanna said, some of these conversations that we see as loose comments mm. are conversations that have been had. Yeah. Are conversations that have been entrenched. And people just people do not know how to properly state them. Mm. Or sometimes people just throw the stone in the water to see how far. The mm. water would splash. Mm. But for me, the destabilization in Congo, in Goma, trust me, me and you, is a question of interest by some of the East African rulers. And the people in Congo have made their statement loud and clear. They know who, are their, who their destabilizers are. And they're saying, get these people out. We will be okay. Okay. Lastly. Barbara, mm. still the issue of governance. As we wrap this up, mm. the East African community seems to be growing bigger. Congo being the new kid on the block. But do you think that, because now we are, I think, in negotiations with Somalia to also join. <laughs> but I don't know. We are bringing yeah, in we are bringing in countries that are not that are struggling with internal governance. Mm. Mm. So is the EAC headed in the right direction towards? streamlining the principles of governance because once Somalia becomes a member then we shall have to borrow certain things from them <laughs> you know learn to be, I mean we are now one you know yeah, so do you think that we are approaching integration from a wrong perspective and therefore it is undermining governance and good uh, sorry good governance and democracy in sovereign states well um, in line with that I would I would want to say that uh, we have to scrutinize ourselves as East African countries and see what are our beliefs? What is that that we are headed for as East African countries before we bring in another country? Okay, do we share an interest? Do we share something in common with the Somalians before we, we bring them? I mean, with the Somalis, before we bring them and integrate them in the East African community? Ubuntu. Yeah, I, the of, I, I mean, yes, it's the spirit of Ubuntu. It's, yeah. it's the spirit of Ubuntu, but, yeah. but I mean, it, it then digests to the question of uh, shall we achieve it? Because if then, if if Uganda, let me let me let me have a case study of Uganda. We still do not have a national language. Okay, now when we bring, when we come together with the Somalis and we integrate them in the East African community mm. in the spirit of Ubuntu, like you've said, then shall we achieve our vision? Yes, we shall. Come on, market. Because <laughs> now you won't need a visa to go to Somalia. You won't, you won't need a visa to go to Do Kenya. Do I need to go there anyway? Oh, I think that you... you, you and what are you going to you do in want Kenya to for, for starters at this point? Because oh, my God. No, 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 no. For starters, uh, just I wanted to just... Chip in a little bit. I'm sorry for the, for the for the. Now, Uganda that does not even manufacture anything yet. What do you mean we don't manufacture anything? We can discuss we value have addition. <laughs> yes. No, because we now when we, we say a common to... market, we have to have a lot of things to offer. Our standard of agriculture is slowly dying. The quality of our agriculture is slowly dying because that was 
our biggest pride, the agriculture, the organicness of the mm. produces of Uganda. But even its quality, it's slowly dying. Now, you are clamoring for a common market. And offer what? Good question. Do you see, that's why some of the things that, the topics that have been discussing in the East African, that East African community mm. of having a common currency have failed. Because but, people are saying, but, why would we have a common currency? Why would we drop our saying, currency? Are you saying that Uganda does not export milk, for example? Kidding. Don't export milk. At the ex is it, is it our coffee on the global market? How much do we yeah? earn from that? How? And that's why I told you, we can discuss value addition, but we cannot disregard the fact that Uganda is exporting. And then you things. will have a common market with Kenya that almost produces half of the things that we are selling in Uganda. And then the Ugandan producers, Kenya is actually also producing milk. We have seen the Kenyan milk yeah. having high ranks on the Ugandan market. Mm -hmm. Now, you bring the Kenyan milk to be competing with the Ugandan milk. So how will the Ugandan milk milk manufacturer or milkman mm. be earning in this whole infusion at this point? Before we even think of common market, let's first concentrate on our market because it's dying itself. Mm. Let's first concentrate on our economy mm. because now when we open up all the borders to mm. these economies, you've seen the Kenyans saying we do not want Ugandan rice. Because it is sub substandard. That's why I said we can. You've seen them saying the we do not want push it. But you see, because the, but, how do we add the, the value? Standard, I think I think the discussion should be this: that internally people have to first be organized. Now, exactly. We are we're adding DRC to the, mm. to the to the to the to the East African Community Block. We are go to Ramanja refugee camp. Mm. The, the three quarters of the refugees there are actually from DRC. Mm. So what we are already not doing enough with the refugees. What do we want with the entire country? Exactly. And even DRC, if the DRC country Somalia, is also saying don't like, bring us. Because you cannot, you cannot be damaged and want to bring another damaged person on, 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 in your house. What, what are you nursing exactly? Look at Somalia. It is, it is a 90 million population of people. <laughs> So what are we supposed to do with the population? 90 million population of people. What have you done with the 42 million? Exactly. Good question. Jeff, yes, do you have yes. a comment about this uh, as, we, well, as we wrap it up? I think that, that the question of the East African region, it, it faces very many of the similar challenges that the states, the individual states within the region face. On paper, when you look at what is discussed, the East African Treaty, the East African legislature, the tenets of good governance, the tenets of free movement of goods, free movements of products across, what is on paper and what is in practice is very different. What happens in reality? Ugandans are finding a hard time processing just even work in Kenya. You know, a Ugandan lawyer, for example, practicing in there, it's not, you know, what is on paper, free movement, goods. You know, we squabble over who should produce milk, who should not export milk. They had rejected our milk during COVID, you know. So where is the free movement of goods that is on paper? Where is the free movement of labor that is on paper? They're all failed by the human error. Rwanda does not allow national if, IDs, for example. If, you know? All right, guys, we can we can talk here until the cows <laughs> and, until the cows come back home, rather. But our time is fast spent. But I want to thank you guys. But I'll give you just a minute to give us your last words. But also, just mention to us your World Cup team. <laughs> the team that you're putting in, in for World Cup, but you have a minute. Your World Cup team and your last words on the show. All within no, one, one minute. minute. Lynette, I'll begin. Okay, with. my one minute is I think we should redefine what we need as a country. Is it democracy or is it good governance? And my pick is good governance. Uh, World Cup team is Ecuador for beating Qatar. I can't say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Barbara. Uh, well, uh, my one last minute word is that uh, as a country, we all, we all have a role to play as mm -hmm. individuals. And uh, for our country to achieve and attain the good governance, and then we need to look through our principles as individuals in order to attain what we desire. Mm. Yeah. World Cup too? Any African country. Oh, mm. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, yes, Jeff. My, my final comments really are that as a country, the only way we are going to move from where we are, where we have been, to where we want to be, is if there is deliberate 
effort by the political players, by the citizens, by all the individuals involved. It has to be deliberate and it has to be intentional change that this country is clamoring for. That is the only way. Unfortunately, as long as the human error, which I have tried, the human error continues to exist, we are going to face problems and challenges of people wanting to stay in power, of people abusing power, of impunity, of lack of accountability. So until we are intentional about erasing this, and until we are intentional on erasing corruption, we shall never move from where we are and where we have been to where we want to be. For this World Cup, I am supporting our colonizers, England. <laughs> <laughs> I'm supporting England, so I'm Thank in you, spirit now. Yes. Uh, yeah. uh, for me, my, my last words are that the leaders have a very big role to play as much as the populace has a say. Their say is based on the circumstances which are informed by the spirit behind the rulers and the leaders. So if the leaders are not deliberate and intentional to have the will, the goodwill of the country, then this whole patriotic talk is also uh, nay say uh, kind of of, uh, of talk. So we need leaders that are intentional. You want to too? Uh, I think I'll be like Barbara. I, I am, I am low-key trying to be Pan-African. <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying. Yeah, so any African country that will make it to the top. Yeah. Ha, w there are also other politics there. Them winning is also another Hello. story. But <laughs> All right, at least they get there. Yeah. Well, guys, thank you very much. Thank you, Comrade Alinette, Comrade Barbara, Comrade Jeff, and Comrade Joanna for sparing the time to be on this episode of the Youth Roundtable. Well, we are told that leaders come from God. But we know that the God or Allah that oversees humanity is a person of honesty, integrity, accountability, all those good virtues. So if you ever get the chance to be elected as a leader anywhere, just do right. Just, just do right, really. And like Desmond Tutu, the late said, in whatever you do, just do right. Well, that's it from us. Have a lovely week. See you next week, same time, same place. Bye-bye.